The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> to maintain his individuality, but little by little, he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more to the wall. Now we try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. <laughs> now, here's a fella with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use Now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. <laughs> Notice, they take off their hats. <laughs> and now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. <laughs> what you just watched was an experiment on the subject of social conformity. I've occasionally touched on the subject on this channel in the past because I personally find it to be a fascinating area of study. And it's the idea that human beings are by and large not living by reason and rationale as we suppose and would like to think, but instead by herd instinct. I thought I'd do a deep dive into this subject and I hope you'll find it interesting because if we understand this subject, it has huge ramifications for how we live our lives and how we understand the world around us. The elevator experiment that we just watched has been carried out many times over the years and it always yields similar results. Here's a more recent example. So you walk into an elevator and naturally you turn and face the door, right? It's just what we do without even thinking. All right, in the blue t-shirt, that is Nadia. She is an innocent passerby has nothing to do with this. Everybody else in that elevator, they all work for Wait. Would You Fall For That. They are all in on the experiment. They are all purposefully facing the wrong way. Nadia is facing the front. You can just see the back of her head wearing the blue T-shirt. That's Nadia. She is facing the front of the elevator like a normal human being. Everybody else is facing the back. We're playing this to you in real time, no editing, as it actually happened. OK, floor two. Rebecca gets off, Emily gets on, she also works for us. We're swapping people in and out to reinforce the behavior. Emily's acting like it's the most normal. Oh, Nadia's turned. Nadia, it... okay, her bag is slipping off her shoulder. She's nervously playing with it. Yeah. Nadia's now halfway round. Will she go any further? Emily gets off, Mike gets on. Again, Mike works for the show. Presses his button, faces the back like it's the most normal thing in the world, like he does it every day. Nadia is really feeling the pressure right now. I'm not going to see anyone else. Isn't he Scott's making some small talk. He was on Celebrity Rehab, I think. Oh. Yeah. She's looking towards the back of the elevator because everybody else is. Floor four. I love the guy. Fourth floor, Mike gets off. Lauren gets on. Lauren also works for us. She's in. Oh, and Nadia, Nadia, Nadia has gone. The fourth floor, Nadia has turned all the way around. She's looking at the back of the elevator. That is not normal human behavior. Nadia is looking at the back of the elevator purely because everybody else is. OK, you've seen it in real time. Let's play that for you again in Fast Forward. Nadia, turning, 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 turning. 
turn. Now you may be asking, what's happening here? What is this invisible force that gradually causes people to turn and mirror the actions of the group around them? And really there's two things happening underneath the surface psychologically that we need to be aware of. Britannica says, people can form to group pressure because they are dependent on the group for satisfying two important desires. The desire to have an accurate perception of reality and the desire to be accepted by other people. Regarding the first desire, it says people want to hold accurate beliefs about the world because such beliefs usually lead to rewarding outcomes. Some beliefs about the world can be verified using objective tests, but others cannot and hence must be verified using social tests, namely comparing one's beliefs to those of other people whose judgment one respects. If those others agree with one's beliefs, one gains confidence in them. If they disagree, one loses confidence. Because disagreement is disturbing, people are motivated to eliminate it. And one way to do so is to conform to group norms. So, there are some things that are easy to understand and know about the world, like grass is green, the sky is blue, this is a desk, this is a microphone, that's a plant, that's a lamp, there's a picture back there with a cross on it, that says stay free, that's a bookshelf, there's some books on it, etc, etc. However, there are some things that are less easy to verify, some things where we perhaps don't have personal knowledge, where we're a bit more uncertain, and in those cases we use a social test to find out the truth. In other words, we ask, what does everyone else think about this? What's everyone else doing? And then we trust the wisdom of the crowd. We assume that if other people are doing this, it's because they have an insight and knowledge that we don't have and that we need. So for example, if you start a new job and if you're not sure how things work in that office, in that new environment, you'll find yourself looking around at the behaviors of existing staff, people who've been there a while to see how things done. And you'll pick things up from them like, oh, I see they're putting their ID card on that bit of the desk when they sit down. I'll do that as well. That must be what they do around here. Everyone's walking on the right-hand side of the halls. I'll do that as well. I'll conform. You trust the crowd to have the knowledge and insight of reality that you need. Regarding the second desire, Britannica says, people also conform to groups because they're motivated to be liked or at least not disliked and believe that other members will feel more kindly towards them if they conform to rather than deviate from group norms. So human beings are intensely social beings, they're hyper-social beings. We have the strong desire to be liked and to have community. And one of the ways that we create this bond and this community is by mirroring the people that we would like to get on with. It's been well documented that when two people are on a date, if they like each other and if they want to improve the bond, they unconsciously start to mirror each other's movements. And this creates a feeling of being in sync, a feeling of connection. It communicates the idea that we're the same, you and I. As we move along, what you notice is that every time she moves, he moves. She moves, he moves. This is clearly isopraxis going on. This is true body echoing. Their bodies are mirroring each other. We know that there is synchrony, and when there's synchrony, there's harmony. Just before the 11 minute mark, we see them laughing simultaneously. And that is uh, probably one of the most apparent displays that we have as humans of we are in synchrony. It's kind of a beautiful dance to watch, especially when you look at it at rapid speed. When one touches the face, such as at the 13 minute mark, the other one touches the face and so forth. As you move between 30 and 33 minutes, you'll notice that the quick head movements that she makes are mirrored almost perfectly by the same head movements that he makes, which again is indicative of psychological comfort and harmony. The same thing happens in a broader sense. We're always on a subconscious level assessing and scanning the social environment that we're in and then mirroring to communicate and reinforce the sense of harmony being in sync, belonging, this sense of community. If we find ourselves out of sync for whatever reason, we feel this immediate discomfort and have the strong desire to course correct and to readapt to the herd. You may have also seen, and this would be another example of this, people who go to a different country and start almost immediately picking up the twang or the accent of the place so that their modes of speech also conform to the herd and create the sense of being in sync. So adapting to the crowd is firstly a way to ascertain reality when you're not certain, and secondly, a way to find and reinforce a sense of community. So in the elevator experiment, the thought process is something like, 
why is everyone facing the back wall? The crowd must know something I don't. Maybe there's a new policy in the building I've not heard about yet. There's a reality, I guess, I'm not aware of. And also perhaps I don't want to be disliked for being the weirdo who's doing the wrong thing and who's facing in the wrong direction. I want to feel liked. I want to feel like I'm part of the group. Now, so strong are these desires to conform that as we've just seen, people will even do nonsensical things, literally things that have no sense at all if it means fitting in. Gustave Le Bon, a French social psychologist, is considered the father of crowd psychology. In his book, The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind, he says that when an individual joins a crowd, he undergoes a profound psychological transformation. He ceases to operate as an individual. Le Bon says, he is no longer himself, but has become an automaton who has ceased to be guided by his will. He says, in a crowd, every sentiment and act is contagious. We will naturally conform and start doing what everyone else is doing, even if it makes no sense whatsoever, even if we don't understand why we're doing it. And in this next experiment called the waiting room experiment, it emphasizes that point. I've used this clip before, and it's something that really lives long in the memory. To answer that question, we set up a hidden camera experiment to see if this woman would stand up at the sound of this tone, simply because everyone else is. You might be thinking you'd never go along with this. Or would you? After just three beeps, and without knowing why she's doing it, this woman is now conforming perfectly to the group. But what happens if we take the group away? Elaine, please. Okay, now she's alone, the crowd is gone, and nobody is watching her, except our hidden cameras. What do you think she'll do? She's now conforming to the rules of the group without them even being there. So remember, there are two motives at work here. The woman sees everyone standing up on the buzzer and thinks, I want to have an accurate perception of the world. If everyone else is doing this, there must be a reason. I better join in. And she may also be thinking, I want to be liked. If I'm the only one in the room not doing this, I stand out. So for these two reasons, she feels an intense discomfort, which can only be fixed by getting in sync with the herd. When I saw everybody stand up, I felt like I needed to join them. Otherwise, I'm like excluded. Once I decided to go with it, then I felt much more comfortable. And interestingly, once she has been conditioned by the crowd to behave in this way, not only will she continue to do it while alone, but she then becomes a vector for this behavior to spread to others. And so the nonsensical behavior starts spreading through society through her. There's something of a social contagion that takes place. Now, watch what happens when we introduce another outsider who doesn't know the rules. Have a seat and they'll be out in just a couple minutes. Great, great. Thanks so much. Everybody was doing it, so I thought I was supposed to. Think she'll teach the new guy what to do? We kept the cameras rolling as more unsuspecting patients arrived. And slowly but surely, what began as a random rule for this woman has now become the social norm for everyone in this waiting room. And it's why even this rebel, who wasn't standing for any of this nonsense, eventually joined the ranks.
And the only thing more shocking than seeing how easily conformity affects the way you act is that similar forces are subconsciously shaping the way you think right now. We'll talk about how our thoughts are being subconsciously shaped a little bit later on in the series. But to wrap up this episode, I just want to focus for a bit longer on this concept of social contagion. There's a well-known study called the Framingham Heart Study. It's one of the largest and longest health studies that's ever been conducted. It's very well known. Some of the data thrown up by that study was processed by a couple of men called Nicholas Christakis and James Fowler, and they discovered something absolutely fascinating. That if a friend of yours becomes obese, there's a 45% increased chance that you will also gain weight over the next two to four years. But that's not the extraordinary part. If a friend of your friend is obese, there's still a 20% chance that you will gain weight too, even if you've never met that person. If a friend of a friend of a friend is a bee, so three links away in the chain, there's still a 10% chance that you'll gain weight. Now, after exploring the variety of reasons why this could be, they concluded that it basically comes down to social norms and social contagion. If you see obesity around you, it changes your perception of what a normal body size is. It creates a norm and then you will conform to that norm. You'll conform to the people around you. So even when the obese person is three links away in the chain, it changes the second link's perception and they conform to the norm, which changes the first link's perception and they conform to that norm. And then that changes your perception and you conform to that norm as well. They found a similar thing with smoking. If your friend smokes, you are 61% more likely to become a smoker as well. If a friend of a friend smokes, you are still 29% more likely to smoke too, even if you've never met that person. If it's a friend of a friend of a friend, you're still 11% more likely to smoke as well. It's all down to a norm being established within a group. And then much like the woman in the waiting room, as each person adapts to that norm, they then become a vector for that behavior to spread to others as well. And thus we get this phenomenon of social contagion. Now we'll pause here, but something to think about before we go into episode two. And you know, take out the series wherever you can, but I'm just gonna highlight some thought points as we go along. And something to think about from this episode is, since you will be influenced by the people around you, it's a really wise decision to surround yourself with good people, people who are gonna encourage you to do the right things, to live a righteous life, who are gonna encourage you into good habits. There's a quote attributed to Jim Rohn that says, you'll become the average of the five people you spend the most time with. A derivative of that is, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. This is what it means. When you're exposed to a group, you'll become a bit more like that group in the passing of time. And since that's the case, make sure the group is a good one. The Bible says, whoever walks with the wise will become wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. It says, the righteous choose their friends carefully, but the way of the wicked leads them astray. It says, do not be deceived, bad company ruins good morals. Since you will be influenced by your herd, the people you surround yourself with, make sure it's a good herd. Surround yourself with the right people, with good people. Okay, we'll pick this up in part two. If you're finding this interesting, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell on the way out. And that way you'll be notified when the next episode drops and you can follow along on this journey.